My name's Theodosia Hamilton Ferguson. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been grounded in uh, Justice Begins with Seed and Soil Not Oil for six years now. And I have the honor of presenting our very great speaker today. Our keynote speaker, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Our keynote speaker is not only a humanitarian, but one of the greatest defenders of the planet. He has served as president of Waterkeeper Alliance, chairman of the board, and chief legal counsel for Children's Health Defense. He was previously chief prosecuting attorney for the Hudson River Keeper, senior attorney for the National Resources Defense Council, and a clinical professor and supervising attorney at Pace University School of Law's Environmental Litigation Clinic. His reputation as a resolute defender of the environment and children's health stems from a litany of successful legal actions. He has worked on environmental issues across the Americas and has assisted several indigenous tribes in Latin America and Canada in successfully negotiating treaties protecting traditional homelands. Mr. Kennedy has a long list of published books, including the New York Times bestseller, Crimes Against Nature. Named one of Times Magazine's Heroes of the Planet for his success keeping Riverkeeper lead, uh, lead the fight to restore the Hudson River, let us all welcome at Soil Not Oil, Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be here in San Francisco. I've spent a lot of the last year living in San Francisco because we had the three Monsanto cases here. And for the, I guess, in all of most of June and July of last year, I was living at the Holiday Inn um, with my son. I had a 16-year-old uh, son was a working as kind of a paralegal and a gopher for one of the other firms that was involved in the case. And it was just an amazing, magical summer for me. And at the end of that case, we won a $289 million verdict, which was, I'll tell you how kind of I got involved in that case and in doing the stuff that I'm doing. I've and uh, since 1984, so basically 35 years, um, representing Waterkeeper Alliance and Riverkeeper groups, including the San Francisco Baykeeper here, we, we now have 350 waterkeepers around the world in 44 countries. The first one started on the Hudson River, and it was started by a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized to reclaim the river from its polluters. Um, and they first organized in 1966. I went to work for them in 1984. They were still a very small group. And they, one of the things they taught me was that we're not protecting the environment so much for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our communities. And if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and, and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, those assets that cannot be reduced to private property ownership because by their nature, they are the resources of the community. What we call historically the commons or the commonwealth or the public trust resources, the, the landscapes, the rivers, the beaches, 
um, that connect us to our past, to our history, that provide context to our communities, and that are the source ultimately of our, of our values, our virtues, our character as a people, and our identity. And I spent my initial years fighting polluters on the Hudson. We brought over 500 successful legal actions on the Hudson. We forced polluters on the river to spend over five and a half billion dollars during the years that I worked for Riverkeeper as their senior attorney. And today the Hudson is the result of our work. When I went to work for the Hudson, it was dead for 20 mile stretches north of New York City. South of Albany, zero dissolved oxygen. It turned different colors depending on, on what color they were painting the trucks at the GM plant in Tarrytown. It, um, it and many of the species were declining today. Uh, Hudson is an international model for ecosystem protection. It is the, it's the richest, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre or biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean north of the equator. It's the last major river system left in the Atlantic that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish. So it's Noah's Ark, it's a species warehouse, it's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of now, as I said, about 350 water keepers around the world. We, have, we run now Water Keeper Alliance, which is the umbrella group that licenses the new water keepers. Um, and San Francisco Bay Keeper, which was one of the original keepers, has a permanent place on the board of the Water Keeper Alliance. But the lawsuits that I was bringing during all those years were what we call statutory lawsuits. There are Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, CERCLA, RICRA, Safe Drinking Water Act, et cetera. And for those lawsuits, you can sue for injunctive relief. You can force the defendant to pay your attorney's fees if you win. And there are penalties usually of about $35,000 a day, potential penalties. But, and sometimes you'll have thousands of violations, the courts will rarely award the full penalty. So you end up settling these lawsuits. We'd be very excited if we got a million dollar settlement in a lawsuit and injunctive relief. But, and I did that for many years, but it didn't really seem to change corporate behavior a lot. And then in 2007, a friend of mine named Mike Papantonio, who's a a famous lawyer, trial lawyer, he invited me and he had worked with me to start a Pensacola Bay Keeper. He invited me to try a case with him in Spelter, West Virginia against DuPont. And I ended up going down to West Virginia for a six week jury trial. And at the end of that case, and I did the closing statement and a lot of other stuff in the case, at the end of the case, the, the jury awarded us what was really one of our record verdict in, in West Virginia at that time, which was $55 million. And um, when we finished that case, the attorney for the defendants picked up her phone and walked into the hallway and somebody overheard her. She was talking to the CEO of the company. And it was very clear that the CEO was going to call other board members and say, we have to do something different. Or you have to tell them something. And I had never had that experience where any of my cases were probably even noticed by the CEO. And I realized at that time that there was a um, that tort lawsuits were a huge weapon for changing corporate behavior of some of the worst polluters in our country. I started doing some of those lawsuits at that time, 
and then I got married to a California girl. My wife is Cheryl Hines, who's the actress from Curb Your Enthusiasm. It was six years ago, and I moved out of here, and I started kind of doing those cases full time. And I did the fire case. I did a lot of different cases, and I had really good results on them. And we ended up trying the Monsanto case. And the first case that we tried with Monsanto, um, we tried here, and we got the $289 million verdict. And Monsanto, that same month, had been purchased by, and this was one of the, you know, the, the most brilliant um, transactions by a company by Monsanto, and the worst transaction in history, potentially, by Bayer. The same month that our trial started, they consummated their deal to sell Monsanto for $63 billion. So Monsanto shareholders and their officers all made out like bandits. But Bayer's total price now, last week, the analysts announced that the total value of Bayer is now $63 billion. So the same price they paid, so Monsanto has zero value at this point because of these losses. We tried our next lawsuit in the federal court here in San Francisco. First case was in front of Judge Belenas and the Superior Court was a state court. The second case we tried in the, um, in the federal court and we won 80 and it was a much tougher case. We won, I think, 81 million and then the third case we went over to Oakland and it was actually a tough case too. And we didn't have as great a confidence. The jury here in San Francisco was amazing. One of the things that happened during that case is, you know, when you come in to pick a jury, there's a jury pool, so there's a room with about this many people in it all waiting to get on the jury. You have to choose 16 of them. We get six preemptory challenges. The other side gets six preemptory challenges. That means we can pick out somebody and say, we just don't like them. We don't have to explain why. We don't like them, and we get rid of them. And, but and there are unlimited challenges for cause. So if somebody gets up there and says, I cannot be fair to this defendant, then either side can say, you know, they're out and you don't get penalized for it. And this case was a record because 35 San Franciscans got up there one after the other and said, I cannot be fair to this company because it's the most evil company in the world. <laughs> We not, nobody had ever seen anything like and it shocked the Monsanto lawyers how despised their client was. And, and um, so the, the last case, we had a big argument the night before the case among all the attorneys as to what the, as the jury, it's always a big strategic question about do you ask the jury for, a, a low, do you lowball them or do you highball them? And, you know, we had got, we had asked the initial jury for 300 million, they gave us 189. And we all said, that's what we should ask them for again, the Oakland jury. And Brent Wisner, who is a superstar, very 34 year old lawyer, who was the lead counsel in the case, said, I want to ask him for a billion. And uh, we were all saying, we don't think you should do that, Brent. Because it might just piss them off and they could go the other way. He ended up asking him for a billion, and they came back with two billion. Uh oh, he was right. But if I was, um, if my life was a Superman comic, Monsanto would be Lex Luthor, because I feel like my whole life I've been fighting them. And in fact, for the thirty for thirty years on the Hudson River, I was in litigation against General Electric Company to get Monsanto's PCBs out of the Hudson River. So it consumed a lot of my life, this company, but even before that, when, you know, this is a company that has made a business model out of taking the worst chemicals in the world and saying, uh, and saying we're gonna sell them. In fact, during the San Francisco trial, one of the jurors stood up and said, I cannot be fair to this company 
because they made Agent Orange and they sprayed it all over me and my friends when we were in Vietnam and a lot of my friends died of cancer. And the judge immediately got rid of that juror. And during the jury instructions, the judge actually told the jurors, ignore everything that you heard about Agent Orange. Um, my wife really laughed at that because she was at that. And she was saying, if you tell somebody to pretend you didn't hear it, doesn't it just make you think that that's all you want to think about? <laughs> uh, but then the I think the judge realized that. And she said to the jury, Monsanto never made Agent Orange, which just wasn't true. Of course they made Agent Orange. Anyway, it was one of those bizarre parts of the trial. But, um, so, the, you know, I and my uncle and my family was deeply involved in the Agent Orange controversy. My uncle had the hearings that finally got the Department of Defense and the CDC to admit that Agent Orange was causing all these cancers and autoimmune problems and other injuries to our troops and forcing the Veterans Administration to treat them. But when I was an eight-year-old boy, I was already a big environmentalist, and I, um, I knew about Rachel Carson, and her book came out in 1962. My uncle was president. She was attacked viciously by Monsanto. A lot of people, when we were trying the Monsanto case, would say, oh, they're using the tobacco playbook because they were using all the same methodologies that big tobacco had pioneered. But I knew it wasn't the tobacco playbook. It was the Monsanto playbook that tobacco had borrowed from Monsanto. I'm going to add some bells and whistles to it, but Monsanto really invented it. They brought in Hill and Knowlton. They brought in um, Edelman, the PR firms, and created all these phony front groups and, um, and you know, devised the strategy of getting trusted third parties, scientists, and organizations. They got the AMA, the American Medical Association, to attack Rachel Carson. They got the Garden Club, the American Garden Club, to attack her. They got editorials in Life magazine and Time magazine and Sports Illustrated going after her. She never defended herself because she was dying of cancer at that time. But she, she was this extraordinary woman who was born in Pennsylvania, in a rural part of Pennsylvania. She became one of the great oceanologists marine biologist, but she never saw the ocean until she was 22 years old. And she was a brilliant writer. That was her gift of taking scientific concepts and translating them into beautiful poetic language. And her book became one of the great bestsellers in history at that time. I think it was on the bestseller list for something like 82 weeks. And um, even, of course, Monsanto had gotten the USDA to, to be the spear tip of its juggernaut. And it was my uncle's USDA, he was the president. They were viciously attacking, and they all, all of these people used the same talking points, and you can go back now and read the critiques of Rachel Carson. They all used the same language. Almost all of them characterize her as a spinster, which was the contemporary euphemism for lesbian. And they were trying to, you know, discredit her in every way that they could. And as I said, she remained silent. But my uncle, who, you know, could not control his USDA, um, made an end run around them by appointing a high level guy, Jerome Wisner, who was his science advisor, to appoint a high level group panel of some of the most trusted and scientists with integrity in the country. And they went through Rachel Carson's book, point by point, paragraph by paragraph, and they published a report eight weeks later that vindicated everything that she'd said. And, and all the major factual assertions in that book. And as a result of that, we banned DDT in this country in 1974. It took us 10 years to do it. We passed five. Uh, we had to have Earth Day. A million, 20 million people come out onto the street. 
That was one of the first um, statutes that we passed, of the 28 that we passed after Earth Day. That was one of the first ones, and we banned DDT. And, and that was Monsanto's flagship chemical. And Monsanto needed to find a new chemical. And there was glyphosate, originally was developed as a scalant to remove calcium and metals accumulation from the inside of pipes and tanks, because that's what it does. It sucks the metals out. That's why, and that's how it ultimately kills plants. And, and if, you, if you weigh a bushel of corn today, it weighs less than a bushel of corn did 20 years ago because the metals and the nutrients are gone from the corn because that's one of the things Monsanto does. So you're eating something that fills you up but it has no nutrition in it or very little. And, and it's one of the ways that, uh, that glyphosate kills plants. Glyphosate was, um, was invented at, or it was patented originally as a scalant. At some point, somebody took a jar of it and threw it in the backyard, and they noticed it killed everything green. And a scientist in Monsanto heard about it. His name was Stephen France. He took it, and he said, this could be a great herbicide. So originally, when they developed it as an herbicide, it, it, the, the, the good part about it was that it didn't have the kind of toxicity that atrazine and some of the other herbicides had. So, uh, but it was a conventional herbicide. So farmers would hire armies of farm workers and they would put backpack sprayers on they would go through the cornfield, and if they, when the corn was initially just growing, it was very young when it was just sprouting, and if there was a weed growing in the corn rows that looked like it was going to compete with the corn, they would spray it, they would give it a spray, and it would die. And that's how, it, and it only, it was mildly successful, it had about 3% of the market until 1996. And then Monsanto did something that disrupted a 40,000-year-old industry of crop farming. It invented Roundup Ready. Uh, initially, it was uh, um, Roundup Ready soybeans. That was the first one. Now it's on canola and alfalfa and corn and sorghum and everything else. But originally, first plant they did was with the petunia. At some point they, they sprayed a plant and the plant didn't die. And Monsanto had told the farmers, be on the lookout for that kind of thing. They brought this plant into the Monsanto lab and they, uh, France and the other people in that lab and another company took genes out of that plant and successfully implanted them in a petunia. And they sprayed the petunia with Roundup and it didn't die. And they knew they could do it. So then they went to work putting it into uh, soybeans. In 1996, they released Roundup Ready soybeans. Now, the farmer could fire all those farm workers and hire one guy in an airplane and spray, saturate the entire landscape with Roundup. And everything would die except for the Roundup Ready soybean. And then they put it in corn and they put it in soy, sorghum and they put it in canola and oats and everything else. And that has transformed farming. So it went from 3% to about 80% of herbicide use in the world. And then, in 2006, they made another innovation. And that innovation was they started telling farmers, you, don't, you can use this not just as an herbicide, but as a desiccant. Which means when the, the crops are lying in the field or they're about to harvest and the rains come and get them wet, now there's a danger of mold and they're much more difficult to harvest and storage, but if you spray them with Roundup, it will dry them out. 
and you won't have that problem. And about, because of the success of that method, about 80% of the Roundup that has been used in history has been used since 2006. Now, they're developing Roundup Ready wheat today, but they don't have it, and they haven't had it in the past. And it's a scary thing. But now they started spraying it on wheat for the first time in history. Not only that, they were spraying it on foods, directly on foods. Initially, they'd been spraying it in the early stages of the crop's life. But now they're spraying it directly onto food, and that's when it started showing up in all of our food. So the University of California did a study in, I think, 2015, which they found that 93% of, of urine samples that they took from across America have glyphosate in them. It's in our cereals, it's in all of our kids' cereals, it's in your beer, it's in your wine, it's in vaccines, it's in, you know, it's in medicines. It's in, we're suing right now, um, Nature Valley um, baby foods, because although they say it's all natural, it has glyphosate in it. And many, many, many other products that claim to be natural are actually loaded with glyphosate because you can't get rid of it. It's everywhere. And at the same time around that era, we started seeing an explosion of these diseases that appear to, that the science says are associated with, with glyphosate, including the celiac disease began exploding. I, you know, I had 11 brothers and sisters, and I had 70 cousins, and I never knew anybody who had gluten allergies and celiac disease, but today it's everywhere. And I would say at least half the people that I know say that they have some kind of allergy to gluten or that they have some kind of sensitivity to them. And, appears, and the science indicates that it's directly linked to the glyphosate on the wheat. But also, we know that it's connected to liver disease, to kidney disease, to particularly to non-alcoholic fatty liver cancer, which for the first time is showing up in little kids, 10-year-old kids, um, to ADD. Um, it is probably linked to autism, but all of these, this cascade of chronic diseases that began afflicting Americans around the, you know, around the time of coterminous or in lockstep with the expansion of glyphosate. And other, there's other things too that are causing it, but the neurodevelopmental diseases, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, um, ASD and autism, the autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes, which we know is linked to glyphosate, rheumatoid arthritis, and beret, cerebral palsy, um, the allergic diseases like food allergies, peanut allergies, e eczema, and anaphylaxis and asthma, all have been connected in the scientific literature with glyphosate. And, but in this country, there is a rule in the federal court, and there are analogous rules in the state courts that say that you can't sue somebody. And by the way, in 1985, 85, before they even invented Roundup Ready, corn or anything else, EPA classified glyphosate as a carcinogen, class C carcinogen. Uh, Monsanto panicked, and we got all of their emails or their, their internal correspondence at that time. They didn't have emails. And what they said is, we got to fix this. Let's hire this guy, Dr. Marvin Kushner, who's one of the world's experts on toxics and kidney diseases, et cetera. Let's hire him. We'll give him a lot of money. We'll pay him to create a study to challenge that study. Kushner, and they said that in advance before any study was done. Kushner came in and he said, yeah, there are kidney tumors in the rats. 
in the study group, the rats that got the glyphosate. But guess what? I found kidney cancers in the control group. He never showed those slides. He never showed those samples to EPA. But he told them he found them. So EPA threw out that study and said, okay, we will temporarily withdraw the carcinogen classification, but only on the condition that you, Monsanto, redo the mice studies. Monsanto said yes, and that was 30 years ago, and they never did them. And now we have, you know, all of the other internal memos that, and emails now that showed us how they prevented those studies from being done. And that's what pissed off the jury. Because they knew that this was carcinogenic. And they were doing everything they could to kill the studies. They had a, a guy who was essentially working for them called Jess Rowland who was working inside, he was the head of the pesticide division at EPA for 20 years. And he was killing every study that anybody wanted to do. It was another federal agency called the ATSER that wanted, it was the Agency for Toxic Substance um, Regulation and Control, that was going to do its own study of glyphosate. He sent a memo to Rat to his bosses at Roundup saying, I'm going to kill this study for you guys, and when I do, you need to give me a medal. And we were able to show that to at least one of the juries. The judge wouldn't, in the first case, wouldn't let us show it to the other jury. Um, but uh, so they were controlling the agency. They had captured EPA completely. Now, there's a law in this country, there's a rule in this country that. If you want to bring a scientific hypothesis in front of a jury, it has to be more than a hypothesis. The judge will block you from, if there is kind of an innovative science that's brand new, that is not mainstream, the judge will say, we're not going to even let the jury hear that science. It's called the Daubert Rule. And it's meant to keep kind of fringe theories from getting in front of a jury. And so, uh, in order to pass the Daubert rule, the judge has to first make a finding that the science has passed a threshold where it is now mainstream science. And in 2015, the International Agency for Cancer Research, which is part of the World Health Organization, and that is an agency that was created by all the major developed nations in the world to determine what was carcinogenic and what wasn't. And the reason for its creation was that people were concerned about carcinogens in all these countries, but they said, we have to have some uniform classification. We have to have some authoritative body so that we don't have different regulations in each country. We need to all pool our resources and we're gonna create an independent agency that has the best scientists in the world and look at all the scientific literature. So on one day, one year, they'll look at caffeine and coffee. The next year, they'll look at beer. They'll look at maybe 20 substances a year. They'll look at cell phones one year. And they'll make a determination on each of those substances, what is carcinogenic. And then there's a possible carcinogen, a probable carcinogen, et cetera. And they do it for animals and they do it for people. And in 2015, they said, this is a carcinogen for animals. There are 11 studies, they all show the mice, the rats, the guinea pigs get cancer in their kidneys, their livers. If you paint it on their body with a brush, they grow tumors there. And but they say, they said, and it's a possible human carcinogen. They didn't give it a strong classification because there were 11 Am I supposed to wrap it up? Okay, there are 11 of those studies, and they said, and all of them said carcinogenic, but none of, them, none of them were that strong, but all of them said yes. Oh, anyway, that allowed us to get by Dalbert. And once we got by Dalbert and got in front of a jury, it was, you know, a dead end for, it was curtains for Monsanto. Um, but and I, I'll just, let me, let me, kind of sum up 
I tell it by putting this in a broader context. Monsanto and these companies like that all love to say, get off our back with your regulations because free market capitalism is what made this nation great. But if you look at their feet, rather than listening to these seductive noises that come from their mouths, they hate free market capitalism. What they want is a very cushy socialism for the rich and for big corporations and a barbaric, savage form of capitalism for the poor. And for many, many years, people have asked me, what do you think the best solution to the environment is? And I've always said the same thing. It's true free market capitalism. Because in a true free market, a true free market promotes efficiency. And efficiency means the elimination of waste. And pollution is waste. In a true free market, we would be required to properly value our natural resources, the commons. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. What polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for the rest of us. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. In a true free market, if you're an actor in the marketplace, you pay the cost of bringing your product to market. And that includes the cost of cleaning up after yourself, which was a lesson we were all supposed to learn in kindergarten. But what they do is they use political clout and captive agency and all of their political power to escape the discipline of the free market. I was, three days ago, I visited an old friend, Dr. Lucy Waleski, in, in the Hudson Valley. She's a member of the Rockefeller family. And on the Rockefeller Reserve in the Pecanico area, they don't use any pesticides, including glyphosate. And I went to her home, and I saw something that I've mourned for for years. She has flowers everywhere, and on virtually every flower there was a butterfly or a bee. There were clouds of them, and there were swallowtails and monarchs, and everything that I saw as a boy, and my children have never seen. And I said, this is amazing. And she said, we don't use glyphosate here. And it gave me hope because I, I thought if we can get rid of this, we can, you know, we can bring this back for our children. And they don't have to live diminished lives and impoverished lives. They can see the things that we saw as kids. And, you know, all of those are costs that that company is imposing on us that they're not paying for. What is the value of our children never being able to see a butterfly? That should be incorporated into the cost of Roundup, not just the medical cost. And you know, what we do as water keepers is we are, you know, I consider myself not just an environmentalist, but a free marketeer. We go out into the marketplace and we catch the cheaters. And we say to them, we're gonna force you to internalize your costs the same way that you internalize your profits. Because as long as somebody is cheating the marketplace, none of us gets the advantages of the efficiencies, the prosperity, and the democracy that free market capitalism otherwise promises our nation. What we have to understand as Americans is true free market capitalism is supposed to give us those things, but the, what we, we don't have that in our country. We have corporate crony capitalism which is as antithetical and as hateful toward prosperity, efficiency, and democracy in America as it is in Nigeria. And if you go back, and I'm gonna shut up after this, if you go back throughout to the most visionary leaders in American history, the, you know, the, the, everybody said, yeah, we have to be careful about big government because 
You know, when government today is listening in on our phone calls and reading our mail and putting up 4G and doing all this crap, you know, these intrusive forcing people to take vaccines against their will, and doing all these things that compromise our freedom. But, the, but they said, but all of our great leaders have warned, the biggest enemy to democracy is excessive corporate power. Thomas Jefferson fought. He didn't want to have corporate charters because he said they will take over democracy. And even our Republican leaders, Frank, Teddy Roosevelt, said that America will never be destroyed by a foreign enemy. And our beloved democratic institutions will be subverted and destroyed by malefactors of great wealth who will corrode them from within. Dwight Eisenhower, Republican, in his most famous speech ever, warned Americans against the domination by corporate military industrial complex. Abraham Lincoln, the greatest president in our history, the founder of the Republican Party, said in 1863, at the height of the Civil War, I have the South in front of me, and I have the corporations behind me, and for my country, I fear the corporations more. And Franklin Roosevelt said in, during World War II that the domination of government by business is, quote, the essence of fascism. And Benito Mussolini, who had an insider's view of that process, complained that fascism should not be called fascism. It should be called corporatism because it was the merger of state and corporate power. And what we have to understand as Americans is that domination of business by government is called communism. The domination of government by business is called fascism. And our job as Americans is to have a free market capitalism and democracy where we keep big government at bay with our left hand, big business at bay with our right, and we walk down that narrow trail in between, which is free markets and and democracy, and in order to do that, we need institutions that are not captured by corporations. We need a free flow of information. We need an end to censorship. And we need a free and independent press that's not kowtowing to these big pharmaceutical companies and others. And we need to have an enlightened public that understands and recognizes all the milestones of tyranny. And I know all of you in this room are part of that club, and um, you know, welcome to the barricades. Let's fight to bring democracy back to our country.